Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk Off the Podium. My next guest is a conductor, Michael Christie. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, it's great to be with you. Uh, so the first question recently I've been asking um, my guests is uh, what you've been doing recently. And I know the past three or four months you've been busy uh, using all sorts of different social media and uh, videos to keep in touch and uh, with your audiences and musicians. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's been a busy time. Um, I've had, a like most people, a huge um, requirement to learn about all the social media platforms because I had been doing what everyone else, like basic posts, but to get into the, into the machinery of YouTube, etc. cetera. Um, so that's been exciting. I've posted, I think, 20 uh, playlists on YouTube, all topically uh, related to things that are going on, but also some regional things. Uh, so that, that was... Um, a good learning experience um, connected me to reconnected me to a lot of different kind of music um, with my new West symphony. We've been um, we've been really trying to explore um, like how, how we stay in touch with our patrons who have such varying levels of ability online. Um, and the most recent thing we did was uh, we called the battle of the sections mm -hmm. And we had our players, we, 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 we broke the orchestra up into four sections, uh, strings, brass, woodwinds, and percussion. And then we, we put them with each of those sections with a different composer and, um, and, and a topic. So they had to choose uh, either upbeat, downbeat, heartbeat, or dance beat. Oh, wow. And then we, we did this thing where I just said to the composers, like, I want a spiritual, I want um, the greatest known classical pieces and I want them all mashed up and I and then we had the audience um bid financially their support like I'm supporting team brass I'm supporting team percussion and a lot of that was like their kid used to play French horn so they supported team brass and so that was pretty cool it was very time consuming um and now it's uh it's a lot of attention on the fall and the spring um so like everybody we've postponed a number of events uh, but we are using the skeleton of the, the planning that we had as the basis for uh, what we're planning to do uh, in the fall and the spring. We're, our organization, at least at this point, is not going to go dormant. Mm. So, you know, there's a lot of positives and negatives with this whole situation. Uh, what are some mm. positives, hopefully, uh, and what are some uh, quite a few negatives you know canceling the season you know the soloists and the premieres that you might be you might have programmed you know it might not happen positives and negatives of this whole situation well i think the positives for sure is that we as an industry have been um bizarrely uh skirting the line of online events mm -hmm. And this just has jammed us into something that's been coming for a long time. So how that plays out is a big question, I think, but we're there now. Yeah. We, we are, we, we haven't figured out all the details, but we are, we can, we are on, we have had to take that exit ramp onto a different highway. So that's good. Um, I think it also forces us to imagine a hybrid reality so i call it the borkestra now so like we're half half human half half machine and um i feel like the organizations that can get their heads around what that looks like and not be apologetic about having part of their existence be online are going to be the ones that have i don't want to say more opportunity but certain a different a different group of people they can reach so I think that's extraordinarily positive. It's really forced people to um, think, think about that. Um, negatives, um, obviously being away from your patrons, um, the hit on individual musicians has been just staggering. I mean, the, for having people go from their normal pulse of activity and the income that comes from that to zero, um, I think we one shocking negative that may come out of this is that we may lose a huge number of people to other professions wow. uh, who simply can't uh, can't endure um, as this gets sorted out. And that's something we we talk a lot about um, trying to find ways to keep keep 
doing activities that employ our musicians and um, and stay connected to them. So uh, that 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 part scares me actually because when we when communities large and small lose their uh, pool of players, <laughs> I mean, where, where do you where do you go from there? So um, so that's that that makes me nervous. I'm trying to think if there's other negatives. I will say another positive that at least for New West Symphony has been um, that it has really engaged our board massively. Mm -hmm. uh, our board of directors has been meeting um, triple the amount and people have been really engaged in discussions about what the future looks like, um, the conversations that we're having with supporters about what the future looks like and what they can support. Um, so that's been extremely positive for our organization. Scary to see the to see how you could possibly earn money during this time. Um, but every meeting we're shifting the conversation away from how are we gonna get back to our hall? Because that was where we all started, of course. Um, and now we are having many more conversations about layers of activity. So um, there are definite donor thank you activities that are just online. And that's a layer that's over here. And then we're talking about what does the hybrid Borgestra thing look like over here? That's a layer of activity. What does going back to the concert hall look like? That's a layer of activity. But it's not all or none. It's like, it's shades of shades of all of those blending together. And having that conversation with people who are normally just focused on um, just the concert hall, the number of performances. So I think I feel like that's been really positive. Um, yeah. Jumping, jumping to a different thing, uh, you you did something very interesting with your previous orchestra, which is the I think it was called the intermission talks during the oh yeah right um, and sure. I thought that was very interesting because a lot of conductors or uh, you know pre concert talk uh, guests you know talk before the concert uh, or conductor or a guest and then and then or there's another version where you know maybe after the concert there's a get small you know get together and yeah. conduct or guest talk. I've never really seen anyone do intermission talks. Have you seen anyone do it? And what was the idea behind that? No, no, I've not seen anyone do it. And every time I talk to my colleagues about it, they're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so the motivation came from a performance that I did ages ago in Florida. And uh, the, the orchestra said, we'd like you to have this post concert event and we or post concert talk back and we'll have the audience. So of course, like we, the, the guest artists and I come out with the general manager, who's the moderator. And there's like 10 people there. And there had been 2000 people there. And so we had the talk and I was, the, the manager was driving me back to the hotel. And I said, uh, I understand this, but why don't you do this at the intermission when everyone's there? And he just looked at me and said, no one will agree. No one would agree to do that. And I said, well, why don't you give them the choice? So anyway, so I went back to my Colorado Music Festival at that time, uh, and I, I proposed this, and we did it in Phoenix as well with the Phoenix Symphony, and now at the New West Symphony, um, over two thirds of the audience stays. Wow. So the way I do it is the orchestra goes off stage, and I stay on with the guest artist, or if the guest artist is playing in the second half, maybe I have the concert master or mm -hmm. feature an oboe player, or, or actually, you know, it's one really fun thing is um, introducing the audience to a new member. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, you know, this is this is Joe, and he's just joined the the violin section. Hey, Joe, you're a new face on stage. Tell yeah. talk to us. So we do the talk back talk back for about ten minutes. Uh, I have a little, my little stopwatch, and the orchestra gets their full twenty minute break. Uh, and then the audience can choose. One really interesting um, benefit to that is that it splits the bathroom line in two. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, when we had Yo-Yo Ma in Phoenix, uh, if we had probably had 99% there wow. that, you know, because the sweat's still coming down your face, the, the, the people can still remember how the soloist looked across at the oboe player when they were playing the beautiful introduction to XYZ piece. Mm -hmm. And they can say, what were you thinking at that time? Do you, or I didn't recognize, or that was a cadenza I, I've never heard of, or even just the basic question, like how long do you have to practice so that you can memorize something like that? Or how do you keep a piece fresh? So the evolution of that, um, that we started at New West, which was on hold now is, um, so we're calling it the Entracht. And so I've basically taken the entire intermission 
And apart from about a 10 minute slot of time, there's something going on. Mm. So at the beginning of the intermission, we do the intermission insights, it's called. So the 10 minute, the 10 minute um, chat that I moderate with the audience and the artist. And then we take a pause and then we come back. And at the top of the second half of the concert, we play a piece that they've never heard before. So it's not necessarily a commission. Um, and it could, it doesn't have to be just orchestra. We've had, I had the Eroica trio and they played a piece a movement of one of Jennifer Higdon's quartets, uh, sorry, trios. Um, I've had, a uh, Jason VO played a solo guitar. I've had a Kevin puts orchestra piece. So, um, so then I can say to the audience for every concert with hand on heart, you will have the opportunity to interact with the guest artist at every concert. You will have the opportunity to hear something you've never heard before at every concert. And you have the opportunity to experience none of that because it's at the intermission and you can go off and have your wine. And it's been fascinating. So we've had about two thirds of the people stay for the, um, the chat and virtually the entire audience come back to hear the new piece. Wow, that's amazing. I, I mean, it's really, I, I'm super stoked to continue to figure out how to do that um, because I think, I think that Audio, that intermission is incredibly fertile ground. And it's been fascinating. We've had two thirds of the audience stay for the uh, intermission insights interview component, but we've had virtually the entire audience come back at every concert to hear the new piece. Mm -hmm. And I think that just says to me that we are underestimating the uh, willingness of the audience to go down these different pathways and experience concerts in different ways and learn more from us, not just experience, uh, experiencing us playing for them, but really interacting with them, which I think is, I think is, it's just, a, it's tremendously fertile ground. It's, uh, and it's a lot of the answer, I think, to um, that, that moment when you'll be looking at a pro at a season program and people say, oh, proportionally, do we have too many pieces that are new or 20th century, 21st century? I just say every concert will have it. Mm -hmm. And then we build and, but it'd be, you know, the pieces are five to eight minutes. So typically, so it's not, it's, it's just a different way to, it's a different way to, to, um, to have people experiencing it, but I think it's very effective. Yeah. And speaking of premieres, you've done so many premieres. I don't want to pick one for you, but if you could uh, pick a premiere that you've done and tell me about the process, what it took to put that whole thing together. And you've done a massive premiere. I don't know if you know which one I'm talking about, but also, also smaller premieres I'm sure you've done with, you know, 10 minute works or eight minute works. If you could talk through what it took to bring something like that to life. Sure. Yeah. I've done a lot of different types of, uh, the, the birthing of various pieces. I remember at the Colorado music festival, I did the click commissioning club um, where we had people listen to um, representative works of three composers. And then they, they through, um, so I think it was through a blog part of the website, they indicated which, which one they wanted. And then the composer would go off. I um, also created a commission, uh, uh, a separate commissioning club where I brought, um, I brought about seven families together. And rather than having one person underwrite an entire commission, they would split that up by that number of families uh, or patrons. And we would have uh, dinner and drinks and I would bring like 15 representative sound samples of composers and then we'd whittle that down. And then we'd meet, I'd send them homework and they'd listen to the four that we whittled it down to. And then we'd get together and we'd meet again and we'd whittle that down to one. And then the third meal, um, we brought that composer mm. and they got to talk to the composer. So I've done all sorts of crazy things just to really just to get people more involved in the creative process. So it's not just music director Michael Christie wants to do this project, get on board and support it. Mm -hmm. It's the Phoenix Symphony. It's the Colorado Music Festival. It's New West Symphony. It's, we as a community are producing this together. So that's been exciting. Um, in the opera world, it's been really interesting to work with um, composer, librettist, stage director, um, to just be part of that creative drive and to... Um, help everybody just navigate the world of musical drama. Mm. So whether that was Silent Night at Minnesota Opera or the revolution of Steve Jobs at yeah. Santa Fe, um, I've really enjoyed just um, being uh, an advocate for the theater as well as the composer and, and the team 
but to also say, how are we, how exactly are we going to tell that story musically? What's the propulsion going to be like making sure that there are moments for the, for the audience to have their collect moment to collect their, their feelings. And so that's been, that's been a real thrill. And especially those two works, Kevin puts, uh, and Mason Bates, the composers of those works, these two guys are total theater geniuses. Like they really, they really thrive on making the theater work, the theatrical part of it work, which I've just been, I've just found so interesting. They have their musical language, but they're not at all saying like, it's only the way I have to experience it. They're, you know, I remember sitting there with Kevin, um, Kevin puts both for Manchurian Candidate and for, um, silent night he'd be sitting there in the rehearsal and he'd say well of course they need more they need more time to get across the stage or oh that transition doesn't work at all and he just his own thing whereas i think some other composers would be like how do i retain that special 10 seconds that i wrote so you know it's just different things and i i really tried to foster that sense of like it's not bad it's just not maybe we just don't need that right at that place um yeah so that that's those those were really special experiences, yeah. and I've I've had other composer interfaces where I end up just being more just serving what it is they wrote, mm -hmm. and being more like, all right, I'll just interpret what you've written, um, rather than being like in, as part of the the creative team, the creative force. So I've I've experienced it many different ways. And it just depends on what their appetite is for input. Well, the revolution of Steve Jobs, uh, that's, 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 a big, that's a big undertaking and, and all the other things that you mentioned. But um, is there a moment, whether it's orchestra or opera, uh, where things fell apart or things didn't work and you're in that moment, you're like, what am I going to do? And you try to figure it out, whether it's, you know, a singer or an orchestra or something. You know, I just recently had uh, Joanne Folletta on, on the podcast and she was talking about how it was her uh, subscription, I think, concert with the Milwaukee Symphony and the orchestra pit started just going down while she was conducting La Forza del Destino. Are there moments like that where, you know, you could think about where things fell apart and you had to figure it out and make it happen? Well, I think the craziest thing happened to me a long time ago it was in a small city in Finland called Juvascula in mm -hmm. central Finland. And the lights went out during the Shostakovich cello concerto. Wow. And they don't only went out for a few seconds, but pitch black, like all, even the exit lights went out. Everything was gone. And the orchestra kept playing. The soloist had his eyes closed, so he didn't see any of this happen. Wow. And just at the moment where people were going to run out of memory about what's coming next, the lights come back on. And I, I said to the soloist at the intermission, I said, boy, you really, that, that was amazing that you got to keep, that you held that together. And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even know what had happened because he had his eyes closed. And he was so focused on playing. So I think that was the, I think that was the craziest thing. I mean, I've had, I remember um, conducting a ballet in Switzerland and the main um, dancer broke his leg and we had to stop. Wow. Uh, that was horrible. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other, like it just went wrong um well you know the premiere of silent night mm. the bill burden uh mm. the, the main tenor got laryngitis and so the wow. uh the world premiere of this opera uh with the new york times and everybody else in the audience uh the the cover went on and he sang from the court the side of the stage and bill walked the part on stage so he did all the action and so opening night of the world premiere of, of Silent Night, I'm conducting this poor young guy who did a great job off to the side of the pit, meanwhile trying to hold all this together under the pressure of, of the world premiere. So that was, uh, it, didn't go, it didn't go wrong per se, but that was, uh, it got your attention. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and, and imagine being that guy who is backstage and, and, and you know, he's put in the situation where he has to sing and and do all this and i know you're prepared for it but it's it's just terrifying you would never expect that would happen you know that's just, right just as if you're a cover conductor for someone most of the time you're just like nothing will happen i'm just gonna sit back and enjoy the performance but then something right. happens this one right. time right oh, man crazy yeah. well i want to know about your journey from trumpet to conducting why did you go to conducting i had always been 
interested, I guess. Like I remember asking my junior high band director what it was he was doing. And he said, oh, why don't we put you up in front of the group and you can try it. So I remember this piece called Mountain Celebration. I don't know who the composer was. And it was, it was with the, the, uh, the, the middle school band. And I got up there and he showed me how to do a four pattern. And, um, you know, he, he had prepared me. And um, uh, I got up there and he was like, oh, like that, that seems comfortable. And then uh, the Greater Buffalo Youth Orchestra conductor, um, I was talking to him about this. He said, you know, why don't we do something at the intermission? You can do like the, 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 um, the chime, so to speak, to get everyone back from the intermission. So I remember we did um, the fanfare from La Paris. Uh, we did a, mo a movement of a Mozart divertimento. Uh, just to, so he, he could coach me conducting with my colleagues and it was just be, I don't know, three minutes mm. and uh, we were out in the, in the lobby. So I had all these little opportunities along the way to, mm. um, to experience that conducting and then going to Oberlin where there's no graduate competition. There is a, there is one graduate orchestra conducting student mm. every year, but there aren't, there aren't dozens. So, um, so that meant all of this, the recitals that people needed ensembles for, um, needed somebody to put those together. That meant that um, there was a call, the winter term, the winter term project orchestra needed a conductor that was an undergrad. Um, little church choirs needed a conductor, which I did all that stuff. Um, so it just kept pointing toward, there, people would say, oh, you're, you're comfortable doing that. You should just keep going. And then, um, my trumpet teacher was the leader of the brass guild mm -hmm. and he, he got ill, unfortunately, and he had to um, take some time away from school, but none the faculty conductors didn't have time for that. So under the direction of a really great guy named Tim Weiss, who was the um, contemporary music and wind ensemble director at Oberlin, um, he was my, he became my advisor and we picked programs together, but I was, I did the rehearsals and the concerts for a whole semester. Wow. So, um, yeah, it was just little things like that. Um, I did uh, uh, the sectional rehearsals for the Winds Brass Percussion for the local youth orchestra. It was just one of those things. Like, I just was like, hey, I want to give that a try. And people said, oh, sure. And then they're like, it was, it was mainly people would say, you look, you just seem comfortable up there. So why don't mm -hmm. you just keep, keep exploring? So I think that was the, the big takeaway. So that was kind of how I transitioned. You know, there's one thing that we have in common. I don't know if you might guess this. It's a very simple thing, and most people have it, but this one thing we have in common. Do you, do you think you could guess what that might be? No. Our birthday. Oh, really? Uh, not, the, <laughs> not the year, but you're born on June 30, right? Right. June 30 here as well. So nice. I think I think in over 120 guests I've had on this podcast is the only time or at least the only time I knew I was just reading about you that came across. I was like, wow, this is this is fantastic. crazy. I can't believe it. Um, switching <laughs> from from uh, music uh, and conducting and uh, all of this to something uh, outside of music. What are some hobbies? What are things that you're passionate about outside of music? Uh, for a long time, I flew. Uh, I was uh, a private pilot. Wow. So I uh, would fly little four seater planes. That was a, that was a big thing for me. Um, I, you know, I've got my two kids, they're 11 and they're well, 12 and six now. Um, my wife's a physician uh, in the intensive care. So she's been dealing with all the COVID stuff. Wow. So, you know, I've been doing, being really involved with the homeschooling and uh, you know, kind of keeping care of them. So it's been, you know, it's been kind of a wild time as a family, like really whole you know, holding everything together during this time, all of us, you know, all of us working toward that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think when your kids are that age, like it becomes quite functional. Like you, you, you just try to be good at doing, keeping the house together <laughs> and, and doing that kind of stuff. But yeah, flying was my big thing for a long, long time, hmm. uh, probably about 15 years. And um, yeah, I, Eventually, I, I sold this little airplane that I owned because I, like, I just knew that, like, everybody has to do their thing about pollution. Like, everyone has to, everyone has to be part of the solution for this huge, huge problem that's, that's looming. And I would turn on this thing. And of course, you know, my, my tiny little engine in the, in the grand scope, I thought, you know, why does, why is one person able to do that? Like, why is one person able to be up 
in the up in the sky by him him or herself and um so i don't fault anybody from for continuing doing it but for me i just kind of the guilt um became where i was just like this is i this is not sustainable yeah but i loved it i loved flying over the rocky mountains i loved um i loved flying to gigs i had a i had a plastic bin that i could take to my opera gigs that had my um, frying pan and knives and all that stuff and i could stick that in the back sometimes i threw my bike back there um so i was really felt very fortunate to experience that um and so looking back i miss it i miss it but um that was my that was kind of i had to have a bit of a change of life yeah about that so um and you know the i think now in in, in the covid time uh, just trying to develop skills mm. um develop um skills uh, on computer science skills. Um, and then as, as I think about the kinds of things we want to present in the future, like there's just a lot of stuff I have to learn, like mm -hmm. just learn about different kinds of music. And um, one thing that's been informing my thinking about programming lately is an experience I had in Taiwan probably about six years ago. The orchestra was, was this great orchestra, but it was a private orchestra. It was run by the man who, um, who owns evergreen shipping. Mm. So the, you know, those, when you see those big, when you see those big, um, yeah. um, the ships going across the, the, the cargo ships and stuff and it says evergreen. So he, so this guy owned an orchestra, he created an orchestra. And one of the, the stipulations about giving concerts was that um, at the end of the concert, you had to perform three or four Taiwanese um, popular songs. Mm that were orchestrated. And at first I, I wasn't quite sure what to make of that. Um, I did it. It was great. But how the audience changed after we played our, I think it was Romeo and Juliet and it was a Haydn symphony. Like it was a, it was your normal kind of fun, big meaty concert, but like the applause after those songs. And I thought, right, right. Okay. This is, I have to, I have to file this away, this experience because there's something there's something really important going on here about the audience experience. And that led me to the intermission thinking and, oh, wow. um, you know, just, just thinking about like what they, what they experience and like the purity of what we try to do. And, and, and it's creative what we do, like that pairing works with this and that makes a lot of sense thematically and historically. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to drive that point to an audience in the short time that we have with them. So trying to figure out like what that mix is. And then I've start. I've been doing a lot more reading about Arthur Fiedler mm. at the, with the Boston pops with his 50 years there. Um, like his mix, his balance of programming, popular music, orchestral music, of uh, um, the show pieces that he'd have the soloist do and the, and just the unapologetic mix of things mm. and not being afraid to say, I really like Leroy Anderson and he, is, he's got this cool piece called the typewriter and it's like it's just he did it because it needed to be part of the audience experience um so that's been that's been on my mind a lot um as far as um thinking about what will what we will present online that is attractive to an audience but then also taking the time to think like when we come back people are going to people in our individual audiences are going to say oh so what 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 are you going to do now and really being prepared with an answer for that. So it's maybe that part of our offerings are, yes, we're gonna go back and we're gonna do, well, we'll be, unfortunately, we'll be past the Beethoven here at this rate, but um, yes, we're gonna do anniversaries, we're gonna do this stuff, but actually maybe in addition to the intermission stuff, maybe we will carve out some time to just say, this is one of our great local composers who's done a, yeah. an amazing five minute arrangement of xyz and we just do it because we should yeah. like it's music and it's good and um so i've been thinking a lot about that like that what that balance in the mix is going to be um because there will be an appetite people want to know what it is mm -hmm. um and i think we can't wait we can't wait until everything's back open again to take stock of what it is that we're doing yeah um, and that's been on my mind a lot
Going back a little bit uh, early, earlier in your career, you were uh, very s successful as a, as a, in a competition and uh, it, it takes a lot to compete, you know, just the preparation and all that. And when you get there and you compete for many musicians, sometimes they don't even get to that moment to even compete uh, in, in the final stages. And, and you got to that point where you were actually invited. What does it take to prepare for a competition? And, and how do you come out of it? Because I've, I've had so many friends who've come out of competitions. They're like, wow, I never want to do that again i want to take yeah a break. i want to take a break from music in general it, yeah. it took a lot out of me what 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 suggestions what recommendations do you, have? you know well one thing is that i went through the whole competition thing at a very different time so um i was one of those first people that went through um and that were in their 20s mm -hmm. and now every competition has a like i think the maximum age at that time was 35 but a lot of the competitions now are 30 and um, it's now they're used to people in their very early twenties competing. Like it's such a different, it's just such a different animal. Um, the Sibelius conductors competition that I participated in, um, they, they focused on rehearsal. They didn't tell us that at least that I wasn't, I was not aware that they would be interested more in how we rehearsed than even how we performed. So that was interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, the whole conducting thing right now is like, it just keeps, it keeps kind of going back and forth. I feel like watching over the last 25 years, like sometimes people want um, really good, like technical mastery, like really how to make the orchestra, like how to, how to make it possible for them to do their job well through your craft. And then we kind of go through some swings of like, Oh, it's just charisma. And you like, you know, just, brr. Um, so I, I feel like, you know, for me personally, like I'm like, I feel like the least we can do for the players on stage is make it possible for them to do their job well. So I'm still like, I still feel like the craft part is super important that like you can be as conversant as possible in the widest variety of repertory. Another thing, Another thing I want to talk about is uh, the role of an uh, American music director. If you could tell me a little bit about your feelings and uh, what you think about it and what you think it should be and what you've done as a music director. Wow, big question. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think we're talking about a role that is curator, ambassador, uh, musical leader. I think those are the big, the big things. And it's... Um, it is a world that is hard to explain why, why it works in some cases amazingly well, why it disintegrates in others. Um, it's a lot about how the organization really views the expectations about what they think a conductor should do. But I think in the best case, someone whose skills are able to accomplish those goals, at least in America, in uh, Northern Hemisphere or North America, or North American orchestras, those are good. Those are three good ways to look at the job. Any ideas about programming, what you've done, some of your experiences and what has worked well for you as, as a music director? Any advice and specific tips maybe to other music directors who are doing it? Well, I think that um, you have to really be sensitive to your community. I think that sometimes we fall into a trap where we think, I'm a music director and now I get to do Mahler. Uh, and, and that's a great thing, of course. Um, but there, there are a number of things that I think you just have to remember that, that people came before you and people will come after you. And just because you were there as the music director at that time, it does, it does herald a moment of, of change and a moment of, of, perhaps a slight course correction for the organization, but we're not the Messiah. We're not, we're not able to turn an orchestra from going in this direction suddenly to this direction. It's all very, very gradual incremental. So I think some of the things that I've really enjoyed doing are the, uh, the audience interface aspects. So whether it's um, having guest artists stay after they've performed their concerto for our intermission insights project at the beginning of the intermission or the new work that we do before the second half begins also to give people a chance to experience something they haven't heard before setting up that expectation of what 
is different is I think a good thing for an, an incoming music director um, to be humble about it, to be um, to, to really it's just it's like you would do with anything where you're coming into a new situation. You listen a lot, you just kind of relax and stay into it. Um, I think I think the hardest part about the job, as far as that that programming and is finding what is unique about your voice um, because there are only incremental differences between this conductor's Mozart 40 and that conductor's Mozart 40. So given that, how are you going to create context around that uh, to make sure that that program not only is interesting at the time, but sets up the expectation from the audience that when they come to hear XYZ Symphony, that they're going to hear or experience something in a new, in a different light. And I really do like to think of, rather than programs or concerts, really about the experience. So every program that I design, I really try to think, what is going to be the experience for the subscriber who's seen three music directors before me do this kind of repertory? What's the experience going to be for someone who maybe has come in during the transition period? And what's going to be the experience for the person who's hearing the symphony for the first time? And so that's where I think that, in particular, I'm very, I'm convinced that that intermission time period is such fertile ground to experience, for the, for the audience member to experience connection with those on stage. Um, I love the idea of mini festivals. I love anything that has consistency within the season. Um, it is, it becomes very easy for us to say, uh, here are the two contemporary works that we're doing in the season, but they're one's in October and one's in April. And somehow it, the consistency doesn't hit for people. Um, I like when, if, for example, like a mini festival, like Beethoven, for example, I, I think orchestras um, did the right thing when they did all five concertos with a new piece or all five concertos with an accompanying symphony and set up that that regiment for for the for the subscribers and for the ticket buyers i beethoven was a perfect example of that um unfortunately a lot of us aren't able to conclude that with covid but but i think it's a it's a great example um i think the the challenge going forward when we can come back to the hall is uh, getting more of the orchestra musicians on board with that advocacy role and that ambassador role um one thing I really enjoyed doing was um, standing and greeting audience members as they came into the hall. Did that f at every in every orchestra I've worked for, and it's always surprised people. And when my colleagues in Phoenix, for example, joined me, what a powerful statement that was. So I think the it's the 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 color of the 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 sights, sounds, and feels of the orchestra experience is going to really depend on all of us working together. Um, so I'm, I, th I, think, I think about that kind of thing all the time. Uh, you you raised some good points. I, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I want to go back and, and uh, you said you, you uh, go to some colleges and you do seminars and master classes. Any chance you're interested in teaching college one, one day? If there's a program that wants to do a like, uh, a deep dive into um, being an, a conductor in America, I would, I would definitely talk to them hmm. um, because I think, because uh, I'm still close enough to what those skill sets look like that I think I could really offer some perspective on what that looks like, especially when you're talking about like the total package of opera, doing st standard repertory opera, contemporary opera, all the duties of symphonic side, like I, I can still, I could still offer that. But yeah, if a program wants to do that, I'd be, I'd be interested to talk about that. Cause I think, I think that's some like a duty I could, I could help with. Yeah. Uh, going back, this is a question that I've been asking all my guests, especially recently the past 30 or 40 episodes, a life-changing moment, both a professional life-changing and a personal life-changing moment. If you're willing to share some personal life-changing moments. Um, I think the personal life changing moment would probably be knowing that, uh, hmm, probably when my wife 
agreed to come to the United States. She's Australian. Mm, okay. Um, and we, uh, so she's a physician, as I mentioned before, and she agreed to come to the United States and have, and we would have our married life here. I think that made me more U S focused, like I want, or more North America focused that I wanted to return that to her as well. Like not just be going over the Atlantic or the Pacific oceans all the time. So I think that was a big, that was a big thing that focused me more on this hemisphere um professionally i've had a lot of i've definitely had a lot of big change moments um that i'm still grappling with um you know real um decisions that i made um with, whether it was like weaving in and out, in and out of opera or symphony i think actually that those decisions those inflection points have been really um really big because in some ways it probably slowed me down in certain like it probably slow going towards opera probably slowed me down on the symphony side and being affiliated with the symphony probably slowed me down in certain opera side. So like those were decisions, but I was, I really was confident that those were the right things to do, like to grow and mature artistically. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, I it definitely just getting older. <laughs> it's just <laughs> been a good thing. Like knowing knowing more about the people you're working with and um yeah what's a piece what's uh a, and you, you as you mentioned before you've done lots of premieres what's a piece or a living composer that you would want to go back to and work with again or a piece even if it's a standard repertoire piece uh, that you would love to go back and do one more time um living composer Living composer, or even the standard repertoire piece that you can't wait to go back to and conduct one more time. Uh, probably Mahler Sixth Symphony. Oh, okay. I can't wait to go back to that one. I would love, I would love to work on a project from the beginning, if time would allow, with John Carigliano. Oh, okay. Um, I really like John. I think he's like, I just, I he's got a an openness toward things. Um. The living composer. I mm -hmm. think I think that'd be fun to to work with him again. I I, I had a a lot of earlier experiences with um, pre Haydn. Mm -hmm. So you know I was practicing cornetto with our our mutual friend Chris Quapis. Yeah. Even though she probably would laugh because <laughs> you know I was I was not sure I was practicing. I was occasionally interfacing with cornetto. Um, <laughs> Um, but you know, there's like 300 years worth of music or 400 years worth of music that we don't in our symphony world or even the opera world that we don't really commune deeply with mm -hmm. typically. And I'd love to have the time to know that way, way better mm -hmm. and figure out ways to bring that into, into the, 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 the world of concerts that we give. Cause that's music people love and it's just very specific and it's very like, you have to just really know. Yeah. A lot about the performance practice of that so um yeah last question uh advice to young musicians what based on your career everything that you've done so many different projects so many different premieres everything that you've done advice to young musicians uh just ask <clears throat> just ask the questions uh don't assume that someone doesn't want to help mm. So if you want, if you need help and you, and you want to know something, just, just ask. There's so many different ways to communicate with people. Um, and now post COVID or during COVID, like I'd just be, I'd be getting the widest possible skill set you can. Hmm. Um, because uh, the world is forcing us now to, to think about we as musicians differently hmm. um, and, Anything that you thought was enterprising before, like we're gonna have to do it ten times better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. But yeah, just ask, just ask. I think that's the biggest advice. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Anything else you want to add before we end? No, it's been awesome talking to you. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. Thanks, you too. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.